each of us have been at this for more than 20 years, and we're tired. Tired of hearing people think that they have no hope, no future, and that they will simply sit in their cubicles and survive working in IT. Well, we're here to tell you right here, right now, that you can thrive in IT, and we are going to prove it. Bringing you great stories about great people in information technology that it turns out are just like you. Welcome to Thrivecast. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Thrivecast. My name is DJ Eshelman, playing the part of your host this morning. And yeah, good to have you with us today. And I'm actually going to uh, kill a open window that I think is sucking down some of my room to go here. Right on, right on. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to try this. Um, we're going to show you a, a, a new feature for today. And maybe even later is uh, is kitten cam, and we're gonna try and get it to work, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, not today. All right, I'm sorry. I apologize. We'll we'll try this another day. But uh, uh, little idea we had, and so there's a, uh, a little cat on my window sill here, chilling in the sunshine. It's all good. <laughs> Got some heckling going on in the chat about the 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 uh, intro music, but that's all good. Hey, we we do uh, we do what we can. <laughs> yeah, Mr. DJ play a song for us. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, and yes, yes, Brian, I am a Steelers fan, and I still have the flag up. That's right, because I'm the that Steelers fan. You know, I, it it's been a rough weekend, rough week, but rough few games, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Glow sticks, really? <laughs> I see how it is. I see how it is. Well, I tell you what, uh, to rescue me from this debacle, I will bring on my co host, Jeff Pitch. <laughs> how you doing, buddy? <laughs> oh, I'm having fun. I'm having fun watching this uh, conversation go back and forth. <laughs> Mr. Mooney, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, you have not only have you come back, you've come back with a vengeance. I like it. Yes, yes. <laughs> By the way, Brian, you owe us an appearance on the show. Yes, you do. So we're gonna hold you to it. Oh, this one is causing all sorts of a ruckus. <laughs> Loki. Loki's our resident uh, kitty with a goatee. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a weird thing, but uh, indeed, indeed. Go behave. Well, anyway, you, know, you, you, you talk about the Steelers. Hey, you know what? Unfortunately, Lions, but <laughs> you, you at least make the playoffs. We just kind of wave. <laughs> There's a um, an interesting um, thing about that as far as like what to do when when things go bad and when you get bad momentum, and um, and actually Rachel, I don't know if it, it's just a they were uh, barn kitties and so uh, American American whatevers is what we kind of call these cats. So I think Rachel made that up. Yeah. <laughs> a Turkish van cat. Yeah, it's uh yeah. So, but they were they're great. It's a brother, brother and brother and brother, uh, Thor and Loki. And uh, nice. Thor is currently chilling on the uh, spot with the kitty cam. I wish I could get it to go, but <laughs> he, um, that sounds like Thor. That sounds like Loki. Loki causing mischief and <laughs> we probably lived up to their names, but that's exactly what it has been. Usually, uh, yeah. Thor goes in and smacks him on the head to get him back in order. <laughs> it's just it's a thing. So kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, hey, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just joining us for the first time, Thrivecast is a show where we talk about uh, not Cats. necessarily <laughs> things. We talk about people 
in IT. We talk about the the stories and the uh, how did you get to where you are kind of things that that really uh, matter to us. And and so we have today a guest with. Uh, an amazing story, and his name is Steve Greenberg. Let's bring it on. Welcome, Steve. Hello, people. Okay, I've got a feature request. I've been dying to speak in the chat room, but I can't. So we need to work on that. Yeah, I, I do need to work on that. Uh, I'll get right on that. Because um, because that guy is here. That guy. Richard, <laughs> and of course, uh, Brian, my buddy. He's local here in Arizona, and Rachel. And actually, DJ, I'm pretty sure a Turkish guy in a van dropped off those kitties at the barn. <laughs> so I think they are Turkish van cats. Okay, so. that, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you don't have like a main coon sitting on your windowsill. There My you go. goodness, those things are big. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, they are. We have yeah. to have Joe Shank on because he's the the cats are part of his world, so they enter. We did. Meeting. We've had Joe. Well, that's right. You did have Joe. That's right. Yeah. Man, yeah, right. pay attention, Steve. Come you on. Did, um, <laughs> did did the cats join in? I think he no. did bring bring one of them in. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's yeah, been a lot of really great time. cat moments in Joe's online world. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> so um, yeah, here too. Well, we've got a lot of people. JD yeah, we Brad. are a lot of people today. I think I see 20 people on the stream so far. Um, I know that Facebook unfortunately had an issue today, so unfortunately I don't think we're streaming to Facebook today. Wah, wah. Um, Have you been banned? The, the platform <laughs> <laughs> Facebook jail for DJ. <laughs> DJ, who comments on absolutely nothing of, I don't want to say importance, but controversial would get banned. That's what would happen, right? You and I, Steve, posting our stuff, we just sail right through. Yeah. This is cool. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> oh, Simon's here as well. This is great. This is like a reunion. <laughs> this Holy is cow. An in-person conference we haven't had to have this year. You know, it's funny because I'd love to say that it's because we're so popular, but Steve, it's you. It's you, man. Oh. It is you. Okay. People want to hear. Well, Rachel wants to know what uh, DJ stands for. Yep, it sounds for uh, don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you've got your answer down. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of one of those fun things where, uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so My, what are we doing? It's actually, it's actually Dustin. Uh, is my first name, but the honest truth is, um, not even my parents call me Dustin, so everybody calls me DJ. So, um, and uh, an important announcement that Brian has calmed down on Facebook. Congratulations, Brian! <laughs> no way, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the uh, disco ball, Steve, come on, yeah. that's epic. That's well, I just figured, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, so we should just go full you know, all the way. I just realized <laughs> I didn't have my effect lighting on today. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. I don't have to show it up, but yeah. It's Steve. I made the comment to DJ before you had joined before the show that what sort of man has so many guitars that he just has to throw them on the couch to store them? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, to be honest, that was just to kind of show them. I, um, I, I was just kidding. Yeah. I think it was funny. But, uh, <laughs> I think I think w DJ will relate to this. Uh, the kind of man is a musician, <laughs> has that many guitars. I don't know what it is, but I guess think of it as tools. Like, how yeah. many tools does a carpenter have? My 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 trade friends, you know, have all kinds of tools, right? And they talk about the new tool they got. And um, plus, guitars are just cool, you know. So yes. you get sucked into like how cool they are, you know. So you know you got to well, start, and and you know it's funny because I I somehow discovered and DJ and I have talked about this at least privately quite a bit is is a uh, Rick Beato's YouTube channel. Oh yeah, yeah, he's great. And and it's it and I have never understood that 
like a guitar is not just a guitar and a and an amp isn't just an amp you know i mean it's it's there are i mean the amps alone are astounding of that like basically no two are the same to get the right exactly sounds and all that it's 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 been an amazing journey like the past couple of months watching his channel Rick's and awesome. just learning and, and yeah. understanding what goes into finding a sound, making music, that type of thing. Yeah. So, awesome yeah, stuff. he's also a real music educator, you know, mm -hmm. like he's he's not just a YouTube guy who's, you know, Googling stuff. He's the real deal. He's been yep. at yeah. it for decades. I actually when he was first kind of around, I actually joined his program where he like listens to your music and gives you advice and I did that for a few months. It was really helpful. The guy's amazing. He is. And I don't understand half of what he's talking about, but it is fascinating nonetheless. I mean, that's just, I think, how good he is, is that you don't need to understand all of the wow. intricacies. I'm really impressed but... because I'm a music and production guy. So, you know, I understand. But, like, that's cool that you enjoy it and get something from it. And it's not even really, you know, the thing you're interested in. Not chatting is driving me bananas, guys, because all my friends are here. So Brad has three guitars plus a banjo and doesn't play a lick. So that's the baseline, Jeff. So if you don't play, you should have about four instruments. So, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm behind. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Plays the hockey stick. No. This is, oh. there is a guitar, an acoustic in here. Okay. That, yeah. unfortunately, I had bought for one of my kids and then they after like three weeks decided they don't want to play it anymore so <laughs> ah yeah that yeah, happens. happens yeah and so um, you do have a guitar up. okay jd's upright bass and and jason it's great to see jason i haven't seen him in a while is um he knows the actual internet lingo which is gas so gear acquisition acquisition syndrome. It's for many years. Not, this isn't even a new thing because musicians were on forums really early on the internet. Gas is like just a constant thing. It's you know, there's a whole site dedicated to it. The, one of the biggest interaction sites in like music production is called Gear Sluts, because everybody <laughs> who's into this stuff is a gear slut. And um, so this is fun. This is a great bridge, DJ, because now we're getting into all these things that aren't IT. Yeah, and all of our yeah. friends are having commentary on them, and so it's a good segue. Indeed. Well, um, yeah. Well, Steve, why don't we start out with like tell us a little bit about your. Uh, we'll, we'll get into um, kind of the, the the other stuff soon, but uh, give us a quick summary about um, how would you describe your current business and what you do. So my company is Thin Client Computing. I started in 1997 um, after experiencing Citrix technology as a customer and just being blown away by what it could do. But just really by, you know, and technology. And like most things I do, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, and I just kind of stay with it. And um, yeah. I started a company, you know, hung a shingle, was a one-man shop for a long time, and just started doing it. And uh, the timing was good, and the uh, market I'm in here, and based on the central Arizona area, Phoenix, Scottsdale, a bunch of cities, all kind of in this big valley, is a good market, lots of technology. Uh, but probably a lot of people don't realize that this is a big technology data center place, a lot of IT, a lot of good stuff going on. And I just stuck with it and you know grew the customer base. And essentially the business is consulting for you know, the names and the faces change, but cloud computing or virtual hosted computing that um, grow into, you know, storage systems, networking. So typical projects, they vary quite a bit, but they typically are uh, about Citrix in some form, you know, often a VDI project. There may We may do the storage infrastructure, the networking. We may do managed services, um, you know, kind of uh, and maintain the environment. A lot of what I do is really like work with the the IT and the business people and design the solution and then really tailor it to their needs. So it isn't really a generic type of thing. It's like, you know, what is this business doing? Oh, they're in the and they're in the process of acquiring another company. Well, what is what's the IT system? What's going to be the solution? So I've done a lot of really interesting, challenging things. Um, one I just did was a great story of um, 
one company acquiring another company in a different industry, the, the acquirer had a really good, sophisticated, modern IT infrastructure, and the company they were acquiring was a mash of three terrible little companies, <laughs> all mom and pop shops with horrible networks, like mm. so bad that they were being acquired and we couldn't let any of that data touch because it was like really like a risk, like it was bad. Um, like a flat network. I mean, like the nineties called and whoever did it in the nineties was bad <laughs> at it. Um, so we took that environment and micro segmented a new environment in this, in this new company, and then went through the process of how do you transform all this stuff into the new environment, but it's a separate environment within the new environment. And that was a really, really fun project. And we were in the midst of it and we were using VDI to do it because it was like basically a windows they had Windows 7 desktops, you know, and they had like some 2003 servers, that kind of stuff. But what happened was in the middle of it, COVID hit. So not only we were doing this massive, overly ambitious, short time frame acquisition, people had to leave the office and go start working at home. So that's just one example. The other one I really like historically was um, when American Express bought um, GE Money credit card division, it's one of these huge multi-billion dollar things. The, um, the the acquisition agreement had a certain number of days for it to complete and they failed on the IT side. They, they, it was actually the same thing. It was several years ago. It was the same scenario. They had to create separations. So um, we used a really early version of Zen Desktop, like it was frighteningly early. and um, <laughs> And, they said, you know, we've already had 180 days and we can't do it. We failed. We've got 45 days. You know, here's a Hail Mary. Can you do it? And we totally pulled it off. So some of them are kind of specialized and difficult. Um, but, you know, that's a, a long answer to a short question. Basically, like <laughs> consulting and working with companies and making awesome. solutions work. Well, and it sounds like you, you do what what is necessary to please the customer, not please, but yeah, I mean, you know, to really get them where they need to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're definitely not a prescriptive type of group. It's more like we yeah. really want to learn what's going on and what solution will will fit. Um, and one of my my things that uh, my mantras, I've done lots of presentations on this and I kind of like to train around it and talk about it, is the fact that um, you really can't provide a proper IT solution if you don't understand what the business is doing you and and in some cases sometimes it's pretty removed and there's only so much you can do but in probably most or a lot of cases um, i kind of insist of going out and experiencing the business because the first thing i was ever taught in it doing the most basic programming was don't write a line of code until you understand the workflow you're trying to and the exercise we were given in this class was we had to create like a program to calculate like you know, really based on this wasn't, I'm not a programmer, it's just a class years ago. And that always stuck with me that you have to understand what you're doing before you commit it to code. And I've learned that early, early on the hard way, if you don't do that in integration, you're not getting the best results. I'm not saying you're going to fail, but the act of going out and sitting with the user and talking to them and watching what the business does, inevitably, I always come back from those interactions and go, nope, we're not doing this, we're doing this. And they're like, why? Well, because it turns out that your branch office is blah, 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 blah. The data is stored here. It changes everything. And that's one yeah. thing um, that IT people need to do better at as a general observation is interact yep. and get into the business and get into the world. And it's not just because we're like to sit behind a desk and we're nerds. It's also just to really like learn the workflow, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I love you to bring this up because this is actually something um, in in the book. Uh, this is chapter two. This is like the day in life study is is what we, what I talk about here. And it's it's super important. Exactly. Sit down and actually well, and, understand them and their work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the end, I mean, it leads to end user satisfaction and acceptance of right. what your, you know, what the project is. Um, you know, I've I've made many references to when I was an admin back. I mean, early I mean early IT, so early '90s, early to mid '90s, where you know we were 
we would just push our stuff onto end users, right? You know, hey, this is out, yep. it's new, it has this feature. Here you go, people. Enjoy it and love, love it. Yeah. And yeah. And now it's it 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 has to be the exact opposite. And it should be. Now, not every company out there or never not every IT department follows like what you're saying, Steve. And it's unfortunate because you still get those horror stories of yeah, we pushed it out and the end users were furious because it either, you know, it's not even that it didn't work. It was that, you know, it broke their processes. They didn't, you know, IT didn't have an understanding of what was going on and and whatnot. And it's so critical to get to delve into to, into that area. And that means getting out of the typical IT admin comfort zone, which is sitting behind the desk, you know, yep. doing emailing people and not having that face-to-face conversation with end users and, and kind of looking over their shoulders. Well, yeah. uh, you tell me where you want to go, guys, but this is an interesting point yeah. because this is one of the things that I think I've done a little differently over the years. Uh, I believe in breaking convention and not really being shy or trying to like fit in. I just find it always works best. I've actually, <laughs> I've actually been in conflict with about customer with customers about this mm -hmm. where I, you'd be surprised, and most of the people I see in the in the in the chat here, they know what I'm talking about. But the, some IT departments will vehemently oppose this. They won't just be like, "Oh, that's interesting." You know, we don't really do that. They'd be like, "No, you right. can't." And I've had a couple of customers that we had long, loyal relationships with, um, that I was like, "Well, I'm going to anyway." They're like, "Well, we're not going to pay you." I'm like, "Then I won't charge you." Like it was like a standoff. And um, <laughs> my favorite one was. Bobby Jones and I went and did, she did most of the actual on-site stuff, but went to the retail locations of this person against their wishes. Not not like, not like you know, harassment, not like we had like a restraining order, <laughs> but they just really didn't want us to do this. But we went to stores throughout the region and wrote a report and um, oh, met with them. And we, we, we were like, I know you didn't want us to, but we have to, this is the right thing to do. They were yeah. like, all right, all right, whatever. Well, in the, in the in the yeah. Well, it turns out that conditions had changed, and these mm -hmm. people became yeah. heroes in the business because the business had recognized something and was asking for this. By, I don't know if it was just intuition or part of coincidence, but um, they came back to us and called a meeting and said, "We just have to sit down. We just have to thank you wholeheartedly for yeah. forcing us to do this." And both of those people have now elevated. To significant positions in that organization. I mean, they deserve it, but yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. So let's 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 actually roll the clock back a bit here, because I want to kind of <laughs> dig into what. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, Lane's world, awesome. Uh, so yeah, I want to I want to get into like what caused this different thinking. So so tell us a bit about where you grew up and and how that was and and let's go from there. Huh, okay. Um well, I grew up in New York outside of New York City. Right. Um my family's kind of like, you know, uh multi-generation immigrants from various places. I'm a mutt of many different things. Um I think part of it may be like the New York tempo, you know, being from New York working in New York City, experiencing that. But my early interests were really more, they were technology, but it was more music and production. And before getting into IT, I was actually in like audio production. I was performing guitarists, working in studios. I play well, I started young. So, you know, by the time I was 16 or 17, I was involved in studio projects and things like that, and then got into recording gear. And so like my technology path kind of started with like electronics and gear and music and production and that stuff kind of became very digital not even necessarily digital audio but midi and using mm -hmm. little sequencers and early program like like ataris and things like that and i got into all that and had a knack for it and got really great specialized work so i so i kind of um just by accident became you know like a a, a um sort of like an independent consultant doing these special jobs traveling and doing things and then in 1989, 90, it's a long story, but I had the opportunity to move over into IT and, and having experienced, um, by the way, I don't see you guys. Am I, did I drop? Or no, still you're there? still here. 
Okay, good, good. So I'll make sure because I do have a bad internet yeah. connection here. Yeah. Um, I, I had an opportunity to move over to IT, which is like more of a lifestyle thing. I had a, a son and I just done some of these gigs. It was like, wow, I can make a lot of money and do great things. But I was being called literally across the world. And I was like, I'm not even going to see my child if I keep doing this. So long story short, I, I, I flipped into IT and it was like bizarre. It was like, I know this stuff. I already It already makes sense to me. I've already been interfacing technology for years and making all this stuff work. And it just was almost like, it looked, looked took tremendous effort because it was all new, but it was kind of like everything made sense. And um, shortly after getting into it, the company I was at needed to integrate multiple platforms. And uh, one thing I'll say about you myself, so to kind of really tell you, I'm, I'm like, how do you describe this? It's like, um, I'm, the, I'm a lazy overachiever. So I like, I want to do things like, like interesting and simple, but I'll work really hard at them, but I might do it the harder way because I'm interested in something. But anyway, we were trying to do these integrations and um, I, tr I just tested everything. I got every kind of software. This is a very early virtualization. No one would even know these names really because it's before anybody knew any of this stuff. And you guys were like probably not born yet. Um, but um, I tried them all. And nothing worked, could quite do what we needed. And I asked our integrator, I saw what he wanted to do. He goes, and this is like 1992. I just right. he goes, well, I just came from a trade show and there was this tiny little company from Florida and he called them Citrus, not Citrix. I don't think he saw the name Citrus. That was before that. Um, and, and he's like, I think they do what you need. And um, I tracked him down pre-internet <laughs> and um, got a demo. You know, in 1992, I remember this right before <laughs> Christmas holiday. I got the software and um, a digi board because we used to do serial connections back then yeah. and wire them up <laughs> and put them by my desk and then came back after uh, the holidays. That's why I always say 92, 93. Um, and I just started doing Citrix and it was solving problems that were amazing and always and very inspiring. Um, and then I just kind of grew my knowledge base um, over time. And that's when in 1997, I started this company. So I already had the ability to integrate a lot of platforms and really do Citrix. And um, now there's, there's, there's a lot of stories, but that's the big, that's it's about as short as I can tell you. Yeah, nice. Right on. I, so, yeah, I have to thank you, Steve, for thinking that I'm so young that I was not. <laughs> <laughs> My hat's off, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I get that a lot, which is... So, Jeff, uh, how did you hack into the chat? Did you just do another login as a... I've got candidate? another window open to YouTube. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, I was thinking just about turn that. off the sound for the tab and... Right, right, okay. <laughs> so, Brad Meyer time. says, um, I'd love to see a podcast about music production from you, uh, Steve. So, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you don't but, have enough but, money but, right now, so... <laughs> yeah, but the principle, I, I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the, I actually speak at AES conferences, Audio Engineering Society. Mm -hmm. So um, on room acoustics and designing studios with a friend of mine who's an expert and all that. Um, but the thing I wanted to say was like um, a lot of what I've done like is very ambitious. And it's really because I said like I'm a lazy overachiever. What I do is I find stuff that interests me and I pursue it. And I'll just set myself a goal that's kind of like way above my skill level. And it's really the best way to do this is, you know, at, at any juncture, you just go, this is interesting. And um, I want to do that. I know nothing about it, but I'm just going to do it anyway. And that simple act is um, amazing where it takes you. And DJ picked up on martial arts and crypto mining and music. Yep, These are all like things that I took on and just went like, I'm just going to do it, you know, um, and one of the things that um, I think that is really, really worth saying is I don't watch television. Everything's a long story, so I won't even tell you the whole story. But about 10 years ago, I just stopped watching television and don't have one. And it's amazing how much time I have because I can do stuff that in itself would be a career, right? So it, it shifts and changes, but... Um, I produce, I arrange, record, or produce music, and I make videos called Live from Steve's Studio. Just a hobby. It's at a totally pro level, and it takes as, as much time as maybe a job would, but I don't watch television. 
So I do my job and then I have this other job, you know? And um, some of the things I go a little crazy with, like there's a Star Trek one where I'm beaming in and out of the video. Some of them might, might take, I don't even, I should count, but some of them take a hundred or more hours to produce. Uh, most of them I write, so I'm composing and then I have to perform it. And the vast majority of them I do live. Again, a ridiculous challenge that nobody really does in the studio world because it's really, really, really hard but to do everything live. And I'm usually doing it alone. So I'm taking on like um, a difficulty that's really not necessary, but it makes it much more interesting and challenging and rewarding. And I got to learn so much and I got to carry 10 things at once and it just ups your game, you know? Um, nope. Because the, the way studio production normally is done is you kind of work on music and with computer-based recording and production, you know, you fix things, you can do a section, and you can stop and you can fix it. You can, and that's kind of the standard. And then you go make a music video. Most of mine are, I write it, practice the hell out of it, because usually I've decided to do something I'm not really capable of and I have to really work on it. And then I have to get it down to where I can actually perform it live. But it's not yeah. just a perform it live because I'm freaking alone. Although Brian came over once and shot the camera for me, which was a huge help. So thanks, Brian. Um, <laughs> But the point is you're overloading your brain. So you can't, no, you, you no longer can like whine or feel lazy or think of why you can't do this. You're taking on something that just occupies your brain. That's what I'm trying to convey. And it's by kind of taking on too much and it, it works. Uh, another example is doing the master's retreat. Oftentimes, by the way, these things are just something somebody says. I started the Phoenix user group and we had a fantastic early, you know, group forming because we had great people in, in the Arizona area and we brought in people remotely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the group was growing and was like, well, what do you want to do next? And we've been doing this and we're doing that. And someone goes, why don't we do a weekend event? Let's do a retreat. And that's the kind of thing that I just go, yeah, okay, let's do it. And I just created myself about something I know nothing about. And that's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> then you start to have to go do all that. And um, the master retreat is a good example of taking on something that, you know, maybe took about a year of planning. And then when the day comes, you're juggling 10 things. And I love that. I love the challenge of having to do more than you can handle and just keep rising to it. Um, my very last video I put up, you can find it on YouTube, Live from yeah. Steve's Studio. I, I, I like that. I gave DJ yeah, that I gave DJ that example because um, I walked outside last week and I had this piece I was going to do and I was just going to play it live in the studio like I usually do. And the sky was just awesome. The sun was hitting and the there was rain over here. And I was like, wow, this is beautiful outside. I wish I could shoot my video, but I'm not really ready and I'm not set up for it and you know, I'm not ready to do it. And I just, I said, I showed my wife, I go, look, I just shot this outside. She goes, that's great. I go, I want to do my video, but I, but I can't, you know, I'm not ready. She goes, why don't you just shoot it all and put yourself in it? And that's really, really hard. I've done green screen, but putting yourself in a natural environment. So I saw that as one of those moments like, okay, let's do this. So I shot all the video of the crazy scenes and the light coming in and, um, and then I had to proceed to figure out how to like, you know, write, get the music down, make it work with the video, how to green screen myself to look like I fit in these environments. So if you just green screen yourself, um, you'll just look like you're floating there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I had to redo it. I had to try it again. I had to redo it. I'd work all day. And then every day when, it, when the sun got to that point, I'd be like, well, what do I have to do now? So I, green screened myself in front of trees, creating shadows. I did all this stuff to make it work. And it isn't really to talk about um, my music production, just to say you take on something that if you just stick to this simple little right. idea, you end up having to learn 20 things and your skills advance and you're able to do more than you've ever been able to do. That's what yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah, and and that's you know that it's that's similar to what uh, Ron Oglesby had mentioned when he was kind of starting out, and you know he still did. He is 
if 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 somebody said, "Hey, I'm looking for someone to do something," he was <laughs> <Right>. he <laughs> accepted everything, yeah, exactly. you know, and yeah. It, yeah, 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 that's right. So that, yeah, and that's I, I yeah. think that's yeah, I, th I think that's 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 a great attitude. I mean, great way to do things. I mean, if you don't force yourself to do some of this stuff, it's never it's never going to happen, you know, and. And instead of sitting there saying, God, man, I wish I had done this on your deathbed or whatever. Let's get morbid. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, you, hey, no regrets. So exactly. I am and, and you fail a lot. And that's one of the things I wanted to say, too, about this, because I really want I, I love your, your guys orientation here to help people thrive. That's amazing. That's wonderful. We don't talk about that enough. So it's such a great angle. I really appreciate what you're doing there. Um, but, um, you know you do fail a lot. And, and that's one of the things that you're faced with right away is you're, you're going to be like constantly not knowing what you're doing. And, and, and that's a good thing and you should embrace that. And, and, and DJ listed martial arts and, and that's like the perfect example of that because I am yeah. naturally not an athlete. When you guys talk about sports, I'm like, da, 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 I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm a nerd. And I was a totally like weak, skinny, uncoordinated nerd as a kid no place doing martial arts, no place, you know, in the, but I just took it on and I've slowly like, it's really transformed me because it's, it's brought the dimension of not being stuck in your head and learning how to like get into your body and get into the moment and be present. And that, and music performance, this is interesting, really probably has in, uh, improved my IT career more than anything else because I can go into a room or a presentation or a stage or jump on this and, and and be natural and feel comfortable. That's really really hard. You know that you got you got to give the credit to guys like you, who are the nerds who get up and do it. Because <laughs> if you don't have an experience of speaking or performing, it's hard. You know. Yeah. Hey, let's let's break yeah. in and see this here from Martin. He says, "Nice and agree. Push yourself to try new things." First webinar I did was a wreck, but I survived just fine. You got to yep. do more of it. And it's so much fun to do. I totally agree with that. There's, yeah. I mean, 10 years ago for me, going back to Ron, because he was my boss at the time, he was, we, we had a, a, a essay on boarding where you had two weeks to learn and you did your first demo within those two weeks. And I'm sure Ron still remembers this. My first one, my first demo was an absolute unmitigated disaster. But like you're saying, I mean, we work in IT, right? If everything just worked, they wouldn't need us. Right. So right. failure is how we learn. If everything just works exactly. the first time, yeah. you're not learning yeah. anything. Right. You know, you, you learn by the mistakes and, and the failures that do happen. And that's and that's just not IT. I mean, that's just life, you know, in general, in, in every occupation. It's just you make a mistake. And you learn from it and hopefully, you know, maybe the next time or maybe 10 times later, you know, you'll figure it out and, and get it, get it going. I, I, I love hearing you say that. Two, two things come to mind. One is that the most successful people of all time have had the biggest failures. Steve Jobs yeah. failed so bad at some things that no anyone else would be devastated. Uh, we all look up to Elon Musk because of the amazing stuff he's done. He, he's mostly failure. I mean... The history of Tesla is like yeah. they shaved out an existence, but they almost died multiple times. And all the all the naysayers were right a lot of times, like, you can't do this, but he did it anyway. And they didn't get to experience it's all glory. They experience a lot of like, wow, I really screwed up. I have to completely change my approach. Yeah. yeah. Was, and and you can't be afraid of of taking that step. I mean, you know, I mean, when you look at success, truly big, successful people, you know, a lot of times we get in our heads like, oh man, that, that dude's brilliant. He just, wow, came out of nowhere and, 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 and yep. geez, now he's, you know, running this huge company or whatever. And it's like, no, no, it, it, <laughs> there's a lot of failures within the time frame before you yep. see him, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> and actually I want to, I want to uh, talk to Wendy for a second here. Wendy Gay says, I'm constantly out of my comfort zone. And that is a good thing. I, I have actually been um, thinking a lot about this um, 
if I'm a little bleary eyed, uh, I mean, literally from like two o'clock to five o'clock this morning, uh, this is something I was thinking a lot about. And uh, so this is something on my mind for a, a an additional non IT project in general uh, about about this, about how embracing discomfort and getting into that has really made a difference. And that is something we hear a lot around here is that, you know, the, the people that have embraced discomfort and, and integrated that on purpose, you know, that, that's how a muscle grows, right? It's, I mean, that's a bad example. Uh, that's a flabby example, but uh, <laughs> by challenging it, that's how we grow. By getting in there and, and failing, that's how we grow. A year ago today, is it today or yesterday, I think, I put up on LinkedIn that my goal for 2020 was to fail bigger and to take bigger risks so I could learn from them. Good. And that's absolutely key. So I, I'm glad you brought that up, Wendy. Thank you for doing yeah. that. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. And thanks, everyone. It's driving me crazy not chatting with you. And I just pulled up a YouTube window, and my video does seem very grainy. I don't, it must be my bandwidth because. Yeah, it's. We pause every once in a while, but your audio is coming through perfect. So. Okay, good, yeah. good. Well, yeah. I sound better than I look, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, well, um, We'll fix it in post. We'll just blur you the entire time. We'll just, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, this is great. And, and I'm seeing Martin and others commenting on this. And I think these this group can relate to it. Um, you know, I think if you're in this, IT is not a, a really, a, it's a pretty thankless career in many ways. And we have a, amazing rewards and benefits. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't really get accolades because everything's up and running. You really just hear when things don't work. You know, it's more the, more the, uh, the situation yeah Brad yeah and failure is the key to success jd says if you haven't failed you haven't tried absolutely yeah yep. yeah i think one I of the things you know, to, to, to go back to you know we we typically only see the failures and stuff like that i always feel bad for uh the help desk the support lines mm -hmm. because that's all they hear Right. Yeah. Is yep. that. And and I've seen I've I've seen companies where they will take help desk personnel, um, you know, to an event or, you know, maybe it's an internal thing or go talk to a group of users. So they get the positive feedback as well, because yeah, you're right. Good. That can be extraordinarily disheartening when you're looking at this going like, oh, my God, what? what is this junk we're pushing on our users? It's, that can be hard. That's a mental thing. And that's, you know, when you're constantly pounded by negativity. Absolutely. Well, uh, Martin has a great comment as an yeah. IT pro, when you're done, your best work is always quiet because no one felt it. There's a story and I, I'm getting older, so I'm sure I'm repeating my stories, but I didn't repeat it today. So it's okay. Um, <laughs> we did a huge hospital um, project. It's one of the first times a hospital was really truly virtualized, like a real, Citrix thing. And it was a big deal. And um, when it was all over and done, we had this fantastic project manager who had come out of being a trauma nurse. So he knew everybody, he could walk the floors, he had the credibility, he had that rapport with the clinical staff. And it was kind of like, okay, we're done, signed off, kind of had like a closeout meeting. And like, we're all kind of like, wow, that was an incredible experience. We're done. Let's do one more walk through the pods. And what exactly to Martin's point, we started going to these different pods in the hospital and waiting politely and asking them, how's the new system working for you? Any, any feedback? And the main response was, can you just go away? We're really busy. Everything's fine. <laughs> and I was like, and that, <laughs> that, that was the best thing I could. I thought I wanted accolades, but I'm like, that's amazing. A hospital just kept going when all right. of their systems had been completely turned into virtual sessions. And they're like, can you just go away? Because everything's really fine right now. Yeah. We're busy. Yeah. I, I, I see that um, nowadays with like Y2K, right? When that was supposed to hit and talking to especially younger people, whether they're in the business or, you know, or if they've heard of it, they're like, well, nothing happened. So I think it was just an overblown thing. And it's like, you don't understand the amount of time and effort and that went into making sure it did not happen. That does not right. mean there was not a, an, a, a big, huge issue, right. but it was mitigated enough that 
you can look back on it and say, it was never an issue to begin with. You know, it's like, right, right. <laughs> in a weird sort of way, that is just great validation. <laughs> well, let's take this one. I fail. Sebastian says, I fail a lot, but sometimes it takes time to realize I did, which is what frustrates me. Same. And uh, yes, Richard says, so. yeah, that's IT. <laughs> Everything works great. <laughs> Don't ask why we, why we do we, why we do IT. Why do we have that? And, and when systems are failing, falling apart, everyone asks why we have IT. And this is the same kind of thing. Um, the instant feedback, like Martin's saying here, yeah, Sebastian, instant feedback is way better, but not always the case. And I agree. Uh, a lot of times we put in put things into play, and it's hard for us to know the right metrics. To, mm -hmm. to look at. Now, well, we and I think part of it they're doing, but we don't necessarily see what the users are seeing. Well, and I think part of it too is um, as human beings, we don't want to find out sometimes if something is working or not working. You know, I, I like my bubble of security where I put something out there. Hey, no one's because I mean, we've all seen this, right? Well, no one's no one's called in with an issue, so there's no issue. Or maybe they're just sick and tired of calling the help desk, knowing that they're gonna, you know. So it's it's I think part of it is that we are sometimes afraid to go out and get that feedback. You know, we expect the users to come to us. We need to go out and get exactly. the users. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also like uh, Rich bringing up Edison because Edison was a genius, but he was also somebody who was just willing to try every possible combination. So like the light bulb, you know, that, that concept was around, um, but he got the kind of the, the light bulb, the incandescent pre led that we're all used to just by trying every possible material. It wasn't like he, he was a material scientist and said tungsten, you know, dipped in whatever is going to be the best. He just stuck a bunch of crap in a vacuum and lit it up and blew up and just kept doing it. And a lot of his inventions were like that. And, and I think that's an important thing. It's not that you should be mindless, but sometimes you just got to put in, you just got to do it over and over and over to get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys ready for an epic question? Absolutely. All right. Rachel Berry asks, does anyone find recently that there's a new breed of user who believe that because they've used Zoom twice with their grandma, they are now a remote working cloud specialist? <laughs> uh, Rachel, I hate to break it to you, but that is not a new breed that, that has been around <laughs> since day one of IT. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it is amazing, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll go back, DJ. One thing about like the '90s that I just did a quick breeze about it. But one thing about the '90s was, and and the, even the '80s, was you did learn by just building computers and going, "Well, crap, this IDE doesn't work," and blah blah blah, and Windows and drivers, and and we used to really have to load drivers. Like drivers was a thing, man. Like you had to put them in the startup files and. You know, you, and, and, and that's kind of how you learned. You, you were kind of self-taught. I mean, you could go to computer science school, but not for the kind of IT we do. Even if you went to school, you learned by building systems, loading software, trying to make things work, being up late at night. You know, so it's a hands-on thing. And it's funny that somebody, you know, gets does Zoom twice with their grandma. <laughs> oh, Brad, that is so true. Brad, you just so all. true. Oh, man. So better get yeah. that IRQ jumper set right. Yeah, and then there was a reason they did call it originally plug and pray because you never right. knew if Windows would do it right or not. But I mean, to that degree, I mean, I, I think there's a there's a level of of you're never going to know all the things, right? You're never going to know everything that you right. can know. And Steve, this is like going back to what you said earlier that sometimes you just have to get in there. But if you don't have the right kind of mindset around this if you're if your you know heart's not in the right place your mind's not in the right place then you're you're done i mean you, you might as well not even start you know the first place you should be is right. deciding if you care if users have a good experience for example in, in energy computing i mean if it's right. just a way to make money get out please yeah, it's not out. a good way to make money and live yeah i totally agree yeah yeah 
So that 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 that's but, one thing that I see with at the same your, time where are those goals are in with that. Yeah. Sorry, I think there's a delay there. Uh, I think where the, we're setting goals come in because then you got to put aside all that kind of emotion or or laziness or an inertia. I mean, uh, that I think helps break that barrier. Is go look. I just looked, decided I'm going to do. Hey, JD, we'll see you, man. Take care. Um, you know, you you decide you're going to do something, so you got to get your ass off the couch. You know, or if you're going to help users have a good experience. You got to put aside. I, I don't really want to deal with it. I just want to sit at my desk, right? Yeah. So goals, especially if they're outer directed for other people and can create some greater good, really, really help get over these barriers. We we all have that feeling of, nah, I just don't feel like doing it. I'm just going to surf the web, or I'm just going to take off and you know chill for a while. Everybody has that feeling. It's 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 yeah. motivating. It's having a goal that really makes you just put it aside. It doesn't go away. I'm well, a lazy bastard <laughs> and i and i don't i mean that's in i think to clarify and you can correct me if i'm wrong here steve it's okay to do that occasionally right just like you know what yeah, i yeah. am fed up i just i can't do this i'm going to go take a break but if you are constantly and i'm not i and i am thoroughly guilty of 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 doing this unfortunately uh, but yeah, if 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 you are distracted constantly, where you are not getting the stuff done that you need to get done, you know that's that's where the problem lies. Yeah. And you know, I I I know over the past year for myself, it's been harder and harder. Yeah. To push myself to get stuff that I know I need to do, but circumstances being what they are they wait you know it's weighing down and i need i need to get out of that funk badly yeah i'm really glad you brought that up because it, it isn't that you're hyper productive all the time happy peppy and bursting with love and you're always high energy <laughs> you know it's not like that like i say i'm actually very lazy and i actually really struggle with that a lot but you have to be easy on yourself there's still plenty of leisure time there's still plenty of time yeah. where i'm just chilling um, it's not like every moment of the day has to be like that. In fact, it's the opposite. It's you should enjoy your free time and your family and your hobbies and 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 have free time, but just be just be ambitious. You know, like when it, when you're when you're doing it, hit it. But it doesn't mean overwork. And you know, I've been doing this a long time, so there were periods I was overworking. Kids were the best thing for me because they forced me to have like a balance, and mm -hmm. that really brought that really helped me bring it into control. Um, but absolutely, you're not. It's not that you should be a drill sergeant 24/7. That's not at all what we're saying. It's just, it's just set goals and go for them. And like one of the things that came to mind when you were saying that, Jeff, was uh, we see in a lot of our client companies, people who don't really perform. Like you'll, we'll need the network team to do firewall rules and to make sure communications are happening. And like they'll only do precisely what you ask them, and they'll always delay it. And then yeah. when you say, uh, we're not communicating, DNS isn't working, they go, well, you didn't ask for DNS. And we're like, do we have to ask for DNS? <laughs> like, yeah. because they're not motivated. They're not thinking what you said. How do I give a good experience? How do I help them? And here's the crazy part. This is the thing that may be counterintuitive, is when you try to help people and you kind of get out of your funk, it's easier and you feel better. It's not a weight. The weight is complaining about it and not doing something and feeling like I really ought to be doing this versus if you just go change your mindset, how do I help them? It's easy. Let me just go fix that DNS. Hey guys, I did it in five minutes, not put it off for a week, knowing you're going to have a little, a little friction and you're just putting it off. You always do. <laughs> it is always DNS, but you're right. How many, you know, I, I can't, Count the amount of times you ask a request, you know, like say a network firewall issue or, you know, I'm putting up a new server, you know, what's the IP, you know, give me an IP. They give right. you the IP, but they don't put in the DNS entry. And it's like, what well, you've given me one, why would you not do the other? I mean, I shouldn't have to lay it out for you, the network guy to, you know, I mean, it's just A and B go together. What's, What's so, so hard funny about, about that? everybody's piping up and everyone's saying the same thing, so you know it's a common <laughs> experience, right? <laughs> right? Right, yeah. 
All right, since we're not really network guys per se, we're kind of EUC guys, you know, we, we have a little, our little um, internal bash is we call it the 99 rule. It came from a client who said he was constantly bashed because Citrix isn't working right or slow or not working. And he said, I always get bashed. And it was 99% of the time it was the network. So we call it the 99 rule. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it's easy to point at someone else. And it's always, for whatever reason, always easy to point at Citrix. <laughs> Even yeah, though, and, it, it, and the hard part is, I, I saw somebody mention, I think it was JD earlier, mentioned like control up and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what those tools are for, is to help you convince <laughs> another right. group that it's right. not necessarily your yeah. problem. Yeah, but, Brian Mooney's saying the same thing and, abso and absolutely. And that's when EG Innovations years ago had that um, mugshot sign of saying that they're blaming yep. Citrix, but it's not Citrix. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and Martin brings up, so the, Martin kind of goes the direction that I was going to go with this too. Just from the, and it doesn't matter if it's Citrix or, or, or VMware, or whatever your delivery mechanism is. And this is true of other things as well. I mean, from my days in a, of an exchange administrator, it's the same kind of thing. It's like there's always someone else to blame, you know, and there's always the, the and the the learning lesson here that I think is like, yeah, we can we can talk about, yeah, gosh, it's always the other thing. But it's that skill set of learning to bridge the gap with those other teams. That's really the key here is that you need to be able to either demonstrate what it is and have a plan and leave the emotion out of it, you know, because if you're going Ah, oh, it's it's the network that's the problem. The network administrator is going, I've got fifteen thousand things on my plate right now. Exactly. You're a jerk. Or or the right. yeah, or I haven't gotten an alert. I haven't seen any issues. And right. and I think and and I, I like what you're saying, DJ. And but I will I will say this along with it. It sucks that we have to do that, right? I mean, why should I have to spend the time? digging through log files or whatever to find someone else's problem. But that, if you don't want, if, if you don't want to get into a meeting room and literally have everybody either point at you as the EUC guy or everyone points at each other in a little nice little circle, you have to do that. That's just you do. part That's of the part game. Of but you know, that's part of the mindset shift is you have to kind of realize we're all in this together. Yes, it's annoying that the network team keeps doing this, but it's not a clear division anymore. Apps are talking on ports that no one documents that we don't know. We got to work together. And it maybe if, if we think of it as like, how can we help you guys? We know you're busy. How can we make this quick and painless and, and just kind of work together? It's changing yep. the mindset, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Bring up silos, Martin. Yeah, so Martin says, uh, yeah, talk to the teams and get an agile way to cooperate so it's yeah. one unit and not a lot of silos. Yeah, and, and that's the big thing about EUC too is that True. we touch so many different parts and we're going to people that only focus on the network or right. the storage or the server. You know, so it's, they are going, you know, they're, I, I mean, it's, it's not the best thing, but they're they're going to kind of say, well, it's not my problem. I'm not seeing it, you know, because you touch 50 other parts of exactly. the entire system. Look, and if reason doesn't work, you, that's one thing about martial arts. You just pull out a sword. And yes. I, I hope my video is good, but I know it's kind of choppy, but you always have this in the back of your mind. I was going to say, you're not going to do like seppuku or whatever that is, the Japanese ritualistic suicide. I, I just, you know, I don't want to see that, man. No, that's a small knife, not a big sword. That's true. That's true. So, Steve, I want to switch the conversation here. Okay. The martial arts, since you brought up the sword. One, you kind of mentioned, in a way, how you got started with it in that yep. you wanted to push yourself. What is the martial art that you do? I know it what is what's the uh, so I, i've um I, I did karate tong sudo which is the older korean style for years and then taekwondo um then my primary art to this day is tai chi tai chi sword and the chi gung sets around that but then i've also done japanese sword 
This is a Chinese sword, so I do that style as well. Japanese sword I had difficulty with because that's like samurai kendo, and I've got a long-term tear in my shoulder. I did it for about mm. three years really intensely. There's a master who lives right near me, Dana. Some people have come to the um, retreat would know Dana because he always comes and teaches. Um, so that that those those arts. But right now I'm focusing more on um, the, the Tai Chi styles, which are, you know them as like slow moving type yeah. of thing, but, but they're martial arts and, um, you know, and, and, and the main thing right now um, is, well, let me go back to like the hard styles, like doing karate. There'd be times when you're pushed beyond your limits. Like, like you're, you're in an hour and 15, hour and 30 minutes. You're, you've, you've sweat all you can. And they just keep saying more, more, more. That's a really cool experience because you survive. And you yeah. go, I made it. I can do way more than I ever thought I could. You know, I didn't die. Right. And now you just upped your kind of your energy level, like in a, in a game, like your health score. Right. Yeah. Um, in more recent times, so it's always had this element. It, it's really the element of like trying to just get out of all of the bullshit in your head and get into your body and have a real calm existence. And that obviously is huge for everything else we're talking about when you're getting riled up because the network team is throwing nasty emails, right? And your, your project's not getting done. If you can sit back and just kind of be centered. Um, so that's the focus right now, but those are the different arts that I've done. And um, it's really cool with the pandemic because I've been super consistent. So I've been doing my sets every day and boy, there's a lot to be said for consistency because I've improved more in the last year than in a long time. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, no, it I'm, does. It, it's it's funny because I, I'm a nerd. I just do it because it helps my development. It's not like I can kick anybody's ass. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I think that's what people have the wrong idea of that of stuff. It. I mean, I, I did Taekwondo in high school. Um, my dad was in it first. He eventually became a black belt. I, I never finished or got up that high, but even in high school, it was a relaxing thing. Cause I mean, I was, yep a nerd when it was not a good thing to be a nerd and stuff like that. <laughs> when you um, to cry. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it was, it was good for me. Um, yeah. and, and it was great. And, you know, I loved doing the tournaments, things like that. Um, but then, well, it's been a number of years now. Um, my middle kid was doing judo and we were trying to keep a minute. So, I signed up for judo to be along with him to try to help him get through it. Oh my God, that is <laughs> rough. Um, you know, and I'm, I, yeah, it, it's, but you know what? It, until I hurt my shoulder, like you talked about, I got, I landed wrong and just it, I had to take a long break from it and just never got back to it. Um, but you know, it, it is, it's one of those things like when you survive, cause you feel better about yourself. And the great thing is, is that when you start doing it and you start realizing it's taking less for me to survive. Right. You know, you building right. that, building yourself up. It's, it's, it's a great feeling. Yep. Exactly. That's really good. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't have to be a particular thing. It doesn't have to be martial arts, yeah. but something that brings in the physical element, especially because we do so much sedentary mental work. Yeah. You really got to balance the, the, the mind, with the body and the emotions. And that, that's the main thing it is for me is to bring that together. But also I'm getting older, I'm 57 now. So it's really good to be having it keep your, keep your vitality and your stretch. I have fantastic flexibility and stretch and strength. And that really helps your, your overall health as you get older. Yeah, I look back at my flexibility in high school while doing Taekwondo and my flexibility now is just like, oh my God. <laughs> That's not, I, I'll break well, it. I'll break it. I, I, I worked on that for many years. I'm, I'm, I'm just as flexible now as ever. And so, wow. cause, cause I, because yeah. of what I'm doing, this particular art really emphasizes it because you do like a deep, slow movements. You have to, all your structural muscles have to activate, but you also have to open. So it's uh it's really, really cool. It's a great thing as you get older to keep doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's a, there's an allegory here too, to the rest of our lives. And that's why, that's why I love things like this, because mm -hmm. like I said earlier, it's, it is sort of like that video game thing. If you, if you go back to like, they got a really high level and you go back to a, a, a beginning level, you're just going to smash everything in there. 
Well, the challenge to you is less, but the challenge that you were originally presented with is not. And that's that's that level yeah. of success yeah. that we want to get to. And so that's true in a lot of things in our lives, just like not. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I just saw Martin's comment. <laughs> I want to know if you learned on, be um, with online courses. Huh. I, 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 I mean, I'm going to. By Rich. I, th I think like you could. I mean, Tai Chi and even Taekwondo, because I mean, really when you're doing the classes, I mean, yes, there's the technique you get corrected on and things like that. But a lot of it is the forms mm -hmm. and being able to do the form. I mean, I, I don't think it's as good as necessarily doing a like a in-person class, but that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. But I know it's a funny joke, but yes, I took it too seriously, but you know. Well, but you know what? Nowadays, it's a reality, like especially with the pandemic, and you know, yeah, yeah. Um, there are high-level Tai Chi people teaching online. There's a guy named Adam Meisner that has um, Heaven Earth Man Tai Chi. That guy's really, really knows what he's doing. If it's possible to do online, that's the place you could do it. <laughs> so, you know, check that out. Yep, and it and it takes. I think it takes more dedication. In that, you are now responsible for yourself to learn that as opposed yeah. to yeah. I got to go somewhere and you know, I've got this appointment. I've, I got to do it type thing. So. Well, that's an interesting subject since we're good. We're just like, you know, going purely on the life side. Um, I was doing pretty good at the gym. I also go to the gym and I really twice a week was what I got into my rhythm with. And the pandemic hit and my really struggle with that because of what you're saying, I did eventually get bands and figure out how to adapt my gym exercises to things I could do at home. And I've been pretty consistent with that, but that's another area of a whole other challenge of like, it was one thing to kind of get into the rhythm of the gym over the years. And I did. And then when the pandemic hit, it was like a whole, like DJ saying, it's a bigger challenge. Yep. It's not the same yeah. challenge. It's one challenge to get your ass to the gym. And then when you're there, everybody's there and you're just kind of going to do it. But like, I literally found myself snacking between sets. I'm like, at home, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, I'm eating snacks between sets. Like, this is <laughs> a bit counterproductive, <laughs> depending on the snack. <laughs> so, because it sounds like you weren't probably weren't doing the healthy snack in right. between. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, the great set. I'm gonna go eat a carrot. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Covered in chocolate and <laughs> yeah. So there's one other thing we wanted to talk about today, and and this is something that uh, Steve, uh, you and I should do a, a separate video on this. Okay. Uh, kind of walking through, but uh, tell us a little bit about the mining aspect of things like cryptocurrency and how you got into that and and what you've done with that. Yeah, so um, everything's a long story, and, and I jump into things pretty deep. But uh, maybe go kind of go backwards, which is um, I, I have a cryptocurrency mining operation, a small one here I built, and I run multiple systems and mine Ethereum and other coins. And I got into it about three and a half or a little bit more years ago. Um, I was vaguely aware of it. My brother had invested in Bitcoin and was telling us all to do it. He was totally right. But it seemed like fake money. Um, it reminded me of like online gambling. Like, so let me get this straight. You're going to put your money in a computer software that somebody wrote on a website where they control the code and hope you win, right? Like cryptocurrency seemed like, <laughs> like some kind of weird, like phony money. Like, well, I could just copy it. But um I originally kind of started on a small scale with one of my sons who was interested. It was a good father son project. And I started looking into it. I'm like, Holy crap, this is cool. And I just went down <laughs> the deepest rabbit hole of all time, pretty much um, because it is the future of money and technology. And it's easy to dismiss it as funny money until you look at like, Oh my God, like the algorithms and the mathematics and the idea of decentralized control where like you put your money in a bank and they just pretty much control it. And as a business owner, I can tell you like, I can't do stuff. Like I want to move money over here. They're like, no, 
you have to come in. I'm like, there's a pandemic raging. They're like, no, it's above this dollar amount. I want to pay somebody in Europe for services. No, you can't transfer that. You're going to have to do this. And cryptocurrency takes your asset and using um, unbreakable math and distributing of that database and algorithms and requiring consensus, a majority consensus through yeah. mathematics, that um, this this stuff is real. It's a big deal. And um, it was just inspiring. And then you get drawn in by the fact that you can build complicated computers. I like to use Linux to do it and this crazy software stuff. This machine makes money. It's like, I'm down. I'm in. You know, let's go. Now, this is what I was saying before about you take a simple idea and you go for it. It then led me into like, well, why does this work? How does it work? Why are these people keep saying the banks? What economy, economics? And I'm like understanding the stock market and market trends and interest rates and what the government's doing with you know, printing money, what that really means and freaking like treasury bonds and all this stuff. And like, it opens up a world of like really interesting stuff that enriches everything you do. But even on a small level, the time I've spent tweaking GPUs and motherboards and Linux software, I learn all kinds of stuff about graphics and GPUs and buses and software. And, and you just like, it's so over your head. You just jump in and learn everything you can. So again, I'm trying to not talk too long, DJ. If you want to no, ask a question, we want, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, unless you can answer, uh, Brad, where you can where you can get a uh, RTX 3, 3070. I'll hook you, up, buddy. 3080, man. Right. 30. My kid is looking for a 3080 and has been for like forever. Yeah. Feels oh, like. And Rachel asking about the environmental energy yeah. uses of. And that's what I, I've been thinking a lot about too. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I, I, do feel guilty. <laughs> I didn't read that full thing before I put it up. <laughs> How dare you? I got Sorry, really I shouldn't be laughing you. this hard. You know, this is good. This is good because you're trying to focus on like life and thriving. This is actually really good. Um, yeah. I actually started studying HVAC. And construction because nobody could tell me how to cool these damn things in the desert and <laughs> i did pretty good i got about 80 percent of the way and but i was talking about, i was calling mechanical engineers like i'll hire you you build data centers this they're like i don't know how to do this and i'm like well here's what i was thinking they're like why don't you just do it you seem smart so like i had to like <laughs> down and then i got my buddy who's my studio friend who's like a genius in building studios and he's also an electrician he's like great at so many things like in other areas and i'm like dude nobody can help me let's just sit down and do this and we figured it out we created an airflow system from the bottom through the machines up out the top we we um he knows how to build anything so he came and cut the holes in the building and came up with flanges and we made like um intakes that open when the fans pull like that's just so much fun like, you know, I spent weekends, like, learning about fans and shit, and yeah. it's awesome. And the crazy thing is it teaches you so much that I'll be in some customer discussion about their data center, and they'll someone come up about power, and I'll just rip, you know, rip off, like, wattage, voltage, current usage, um, you know, knowing things like things you might not know as an IT guy is that all circuits should always be used at only 80%. I didn't know that as the guy who plugs the servers in. But if you have a 20 amp circuit, you should only be drawing 16. And then you learn like at startup, you're, you're drawing more current. And you just start learning. These are just random facts. There's hundreds of areas I've learned something in. And just all of a sudden, you know stuff. And you're talking to data center experts and you're like, I understand it. I know it. So it's just one of the many things that just takes you to new places. But one thing I maybe didn't say, I want to say, DJ, it's really important, to, is always trust the little voice in you that's interested in something. Right. Right? It Like crypto would be like, oh, that's crazy, man. Then you start looking into it, you're like, these people are nuts. They're buying all these GPUs and building these rigs, and they, they're so hot and noisy. That's crazy. 
But I go, but there's something here. What is it? And you just jump in. And then, you know, instead of, I'm not judging, it doesn't matter, but instead of watching hours and hours of television, I'm doing hours and hours of, you know, any one of these things we talked about and falling asleep at night, exhausted, going, that was awesome. I can't wait for tomorrow. <laughs> And it's not, and the environmental impacts are 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 definitely something that that is interesting. I mean, there, there's a lot of electricity used in the process of doing this, um, and that sort of thing. And, but there's ways to offset that too. Um, for example, I'm, and, and I'll give you my example. And this is just using a single GPU until uh, John hooks me up. But uh, uh, this is uh, something. I it's getting colder. Even here in Nashville, yes, it does get cold in Nashville. Um, and so what I've basically done is blocked off the heater in this room. Uh, normally, I'd use a, an electric heater to supplement anyway. And so I just have mining running on a graphics card in here. And, and oddly enough, it's doing a really good job of keeping the keeping the temperature. So one, one GPU? Yeah, just one. Well, it's, <clears throat> it's a uh, Radeon uh, VII, so... Uh, so how many how many watts does it drawing? It's about uh, 220 watts. Yeah, so you have um, a 220 watt heater because it literally converts that to heat. Exactly, and that's that, and that's the thing to understand is right. that sometimes I, if you would be doing it anyway, that's a that's a good kind of thing. Now in the summertime, yeah. that's something I will have to see if I'm going to keep mining or or take that elsewhere. I'll I'll make that decision later. But but for the environmental side of things, that was something that was on my mind as well. Like, okay, is this something I should be concerned about because I don't have solar panels on my roof. I'm not generating my own, you know? And so, but here in the States anyway, there's some options too. Like you can actually, if you, if you feel, feel like ways about that, you can actually buy into solar shares and things like that too. So to, to oh, wait, my house is fully solar powered. Yeah. I was going to say, that's, Arizona, but yeah. the crypto, the crypto is for various, everything's a long story. It's actually on a separate meter because when we did an addition, they gave us a separate meter and that doesn't cover that. But also the, the, the energy usage of crypto is a little bit overspent because it's mm -hmm. still only a tiny fraction of the total energy usage. So people are still using more energy for everything else by far. By, by um, but it is energy by efficient. It. And the solution is to go from proof of work, which is burning electricity into proof of stake scenarios, whereby putting up collateral coins for validation, you're doing it with a fraction of the energy. And that's where a lot of it's going. Um, looks like John is the hookup for GPUs. Um, <laughs> so just everyone go to John for that. Yeah. And Simon says I need a better bank to do when it's called Bitcoin. <laughs> this is YouTube, buddy. You're going to get swarmed. <laughs> so, Steve, I don't know if you saw recently. I sent the article over to DJ based on something he had told me before about uh, there's some dude in the UK that lost his uh, mm -hmm. encryption password. Yep. $248 million of Bitcoin on a hard drive. He's got yep. two chances left yep. Yep. to get that open. <laughs> yep. But that yep. also speaks to, you know, he had got, or he, he had been given it early or something like that or yeah. gotten into it. What I, I can't remember if he was given some of it or whatever, but I think you did it in those work. early days, people, yep. you hear about that a lot. I mean, or not, maybe not as much anymore, but. There was a time where you'd hear like, oh, my God, they lost their passwords and stuff. And now they've got these coins locked behind. They can't get access to them. I had a bunch of Litecoin that um, leaves spaced on the password. But um, you can um, take those uh, files and you can often um, hash them and crack them. This guy's in some kind of iron vault thing that you're talking about. I don't know the details of it. But it is possible to take your uh, wallet dat and actually hash it out and solve it. My brother got quite a bit of Litecoin back that way. <laughs> and I set up Hashcat on my GPUs to try it for him. And I could have solved it, but he told me it was 13 characters. He told me the parameters and it would have taken 500 years, but, it, but he had somebody <laughs> else do it. And it turned out it was a simple password he had forgotten and they solved it in, in days. Um, Yes, and That's then crazy. Rachel talking about the landfill guy who sent his old, um, he threw out his old laptop, and then when Bitcoin became valuable, he searched the landfill for it. A client of mine uh, mined Bitcoin very early. He didn't have a lot, but it's worth a lot now, so it's quite a bit yeah. of money. But he had it on his old desktop. This is a crazy story. DJ's going to like it because it involves guitar speakers. Um, 
So he put the old big, you know, clunky desktop like in the back of his room and then stuck his Marshall four by 12 speakers right in front of it. Cause it's like storage, just pack it up there. So yeah. his spinning, yeah, his spinning hard drive was sitting between four giant magnets for three years. <laughs> And he brought it into a data recovery thing, and it was like FBI grade wiped, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Bad. yeah. You can't beat the magnet. You know. For magnets for that long, yeah. <laughs> Didn't matter, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. But I mean, in a way, it's kind of weird just talking about Bitcoin in, in general, uh, getting into the mechanics of things. Interestingly enough, Bitcoin being lost actually can boost the value a little bit that's right it, it's that's it right. makes it sort of like you know the more scarce gold gets the more yep. the more yep. it raises in value same kind of thing with with things like this where there's a built-in scarcity that i think people don't necessarily understand that you know, uh, let you hit on that because that's something that as this group is a, as a group of smart people we should say that bitcoin every digital coin has its own algorithm that bitcoin is a deflationary currency the more you mine, the more difficult it becomes. And when you hit 21 million, you cannot mine anymore. Yep. So it's the opposite of like fiat, US dollars, Japanese yen, where they just print more when they want more money. But every time they print a dollar, every other dollar is worth less. That's yep. inflationary, right? Like the the costs go yep. up. So that's what the, 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 uh, the creator of Bitcoin, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, envisioned all this he was an economist and a cryptologist and it's just the deeper you go the more fascinating it gets right and like a, yeah. a government can't deflate it for you because they can't produce more and you go yeah but it's just digital i'll copy it no the math is freaking rock solid and every node has a copy of the database and they have to agree on the order of the blocks in the chain or your or it's spit out so there is a thing called a 51 percent attack if you owned more than 50% of the nodes, you potentially could split the chain and send it where you want. But there's so many freaking nodes, that's not even a practical reality. We should address this too. With drug dealers. Yeah, the best way to get caught by laundersmen is to use Bitcoin. It's not it's <laughs> totally traceable. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's a bit of an anomaly there. There are privacy coins that mm -hmm. use, um, types of encryptions where the transaction and the sender and the receiver are obfuscated. That's maybe where um, drug dealer types would benefit from it, but it's not, it's not Bitcoin. Thanks for giving advice to drug dealers, Steve. Appreciate that. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they know how to do their job better than I do. Yeah. It, it's kind of one of those things where it's just like, um, it, like you said earlier, it's a, it's a tool, you know, it's, it's not the end all. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a mechanism. Um, yep. But honestly, I think the, 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 in my opinion, these days, the, the benefits far outweigh any kind of negative imp impacts. Because there's always negative impacts with anything that, that, that causes a change and causes a shift. Yep. But this yeah. is like, a, it, it's equalizing the world economy as well. Right. That's right. It's, it's getting, I mean, it, there's like, as far as US dollars, there's one trillion in value just in bitcoin there's other cryptocurrencies too but what that's what that means is that that is spread geographically it's not just concentrated in one place so that means right. that the same value is the same value everywhere you go now exchange values are one yeah. thing but that's true of every fiat currency everything right exactly so so there's some you know, impact there's that... people like in a, in a third world country with an unstable government with a worthless currency to hold assets and to transact without being killed by the fact that their dollar their currency, you know, devalues every day and has no value and you can't buy anything. And it, it can lift people out of poverty as well because they can get into like let's say Bitcoin or other coins and, mm -hmm. um, you know, maintain their assets. They don't just go away in value because their society is falling apart. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, fraud is nothing new under the sun. I mean, there's always ways to, hide money from governments and things like that. But the reality is that, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening in cryptocurrency right now that um, the it, decentralizing and getting away from banks makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I still would want a bank to hold my crypto as a custody. I, I recognize the security value. And I do um, that for that exact yeah. reason. 
It's like oh, I don't you, you have to in a bank though. I haven't found a bank that will do it. Oh, as far as like a, a like a, a real like a, a yeah, like an actual like I wouldn't oh. mind using a bank to like per, like to insure it and protect. Yeah, so, so not an endorsement, know. not anything like that. But I use Coinbase today. Right. Um, they're U.S. based, and so that that does mean there's scrutiny, obviously, but that right. there's also some insurance mechanisms and things like that. That um, yeah. so the reason why <laughs> this is fun. Um, so a lot of people have heard of the Mt. Gox. Uh, yep issue with their trading platform that happened. Um, and I was, I was a victim of that. Um, oh, were you? Uh, yeah, I lost, um, I think it was between 11 and 13 uh, Bitcoin with that. So with its current value of, uh, I haven't checked today, but last 30, I checked, 000, it was around 40,000. Yeah. So yeah, do the math. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> house you, didn't, you get anything, you didn't get anything back at all on the, um, the settlement thing no, they did. I think the, the the odds of that happening are, are very very low. Um, they you know because of the way it was structured with the settlement, uh, they'd have to pay back in Bitcoin, which is nearly impossible right now. I mean, actually, not nearly impossible. It is impossible. Yeah, so, yeah. Unfortunate. Um, but, by the way, if you wanted to like crack down on crime and what currency has the most crime associated with it, it would be the U.S. dollar. Like yeah. you know. Many, many, mul thousands of times more transactions in crime in U.S. dollars than in Bitcoin. So we probably should shut down the U.S. dollar. Indeed, indeed. I'm not an you're, anarchist. Buddy. You're all I boy. Don't. That's it. That's it. Steve yeah, just kicked it. off a new revolution. <laughs> I really. I, by the way, I do want to say I don't. I don't. I'm not one of these people that thinks we should destroy the banking system and all. But I just want to have. <laughs> I want to have the option that Some you can hold your assets. Yeah. In your own way, and um, and I may have exaggerated slightly. Simon called me out on the bank thing. They didn't prevent me from using my money, but they make it difficult and they put limits on transactions yeah. and what you can do online and so yeah. forth. Right. Yeah, so that's because of the, exactly what you're saying about the the right. uh, the, the crime and things that go on. You know, yeah. there's some things that they, they have to do. Um, and you know, I can envision controls like that being voted in. And that's the other thing we need to talk, we could talk about too, as far as cryptocurrency goes, is a lot of the way these things are structured are voted by the consensus as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you have it, depending on the, the cryptocurrency, um, some are like stake based, some are, you know, minor, you know, minor based, um, proof of work based. Right. But if you hold a lot and have a master node, that sort of thing, then you have some ability to vote on, you know, what's going to happen with that. And so, there could be some that emerge that say, you know what, we're going to limit the amount that's transferred at any given moment. You know, that could be a thing. That could totally be a thing. Uh, there may <clears> be <throat> out there that are doing that right now. I don't know. But uh, that's the other beauty of this is that it can be, again, worldwide and not limited to a, a single government's, uh, because we see how much governments can can shift opinions rapidly. <laughs> um, yeah, and, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. And that whole topic of tech companies and censorship is probably, especially we've been going for a while, we don't want to get into that, but that's a really interesting discussion that does play into all this. Um, yeah. But I, having said that, I also believe in being an above board citizen. I will sign up with my real information. I will provide Coinbase with who, you know, KYC, you know the customer, who you are, I have nothing to hide. But the implications of some of these things are, pretty excessive as people know from things like the social dilemma and other mm -hmm. yeah, problems. Yeah. And, and there's things too that have been done with, with, uh, with blockchain and with um, cryptocurrency that are really interesting. You know, some of the things that are doing um, to decentralize things like storage, you know, um, that are, that are going to make it possible to be decentralized even in that fat, in that fashion. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Filecoin a lot right now. Um, it's a fascinating concept. Um, it's a little, little, uh, you know, young yet, but, um, uh, and some of the other coins that are like it, like, uh, Sia coin and things like that didn't do quite as well as I would, would have thought, but, but did there... Filecoin, could, for, I looked at Filecoin when it came out and for some people know that it, it uses storage as a, like a, a resource. Like if you provide storage to mm -hmm. this network, you, you make money doing that. Like you might mine. You're actually providing a place to store things 
And it's really interesting. I, when they first announced I wanted to get involved, they just, they never really, I never saw them actually go live. I'm sure they did at some point, but you know. Yeah, uh, just last last month, I think, is when oh, they, really? they wow. uh, oh. main net. Yeah, it, it's kind of, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see the other things that are happening because of these concepts and how they work together and these kind of things. It, 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 it fascinates me to no end. Um, so, and uh, this is actually kind of funny. I'll, I'll put it <laughs> up. I probably will regret this, but um, the lift and shift uh, parlor, it's funny to bring that up right because that's something I thought about last night. I was like, wow, if they were on Filecoin, they couldn't, this could not have happened to them. And well, you just that. helped them out. Yeah. Hey, you I know what? The interplanetary oh, file system is a way, yeah. like cryptocurrency, it's a way of everybody contributing storage and mm -hmm. everything gets distributed and um, encrypted and um, no central control. Everything right. exists in multiple places through encrypted pointers. And that's the stuff we're going to have to get into to like to actually own our own data. But all the technology is there and it's evolving rapidly. Yep. Yeah, and I think and I, and I think as we're with the internet, you know, makes makes so much of this possible nowadays. Um, but it's also, you know, as we're seeing, there, there's a dark side, and I'm not talking about the dark web, uh, mm -hmm. to what people can do today um, with deep fakes and stuff like that. That just is is insane. So <laughs> deep fakes is freaky. Yeah, it, honestly, it, there's a lot that's going on here. And I, and I was actually, so it's funny, Steve, you mentioned uh, a social dilemma because uh, we watched, my wife and I watched that yesterday uh, just to refresh. And one of the things I was thinking about, there's, a, there's a, a subtle little point that was made there that I think got missed in that, you know, when it comes to things like this, what I want is for there to be information everywhere. That's what I want. You know, I want right. no controls. I want, you know, people to make up their own minds about what they should be watching and, and, and taking in. The problem is our brains aren't ready for it. This is blatantly apparent right now. This is, yeah. We're not, we're <laughs> not ready to, to consume that in that, in that way. We just assume that everything in, that's put in front of us on the screen is factual, you know, and that's, that's a shame. Well, it, it, and I think it goes back to the echo chamber effect, right? I mean, it's, it's it's great if all of this information is out there. I, I, I uh, Ryan and I uh, got into a little bit on uh, Twitter the other day about, you know, hey, you know, you can people can put out bad information, people can put out good information to counter that, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really work, unfortunately, well, because we all, yeah, in our own way, you know, end up in echo chambers, and that yeah. other information doesn't get put in front of people that, you know, to make those informed decisions. Um, and so that's, that's, you're right. It, the, it's, it's the brain, us not being able to be able to handle this much data. Um, and we make, and so it's easier for us to just keep seeing the same thing and processing that than it does to try to process and then, think through both sides, you know, it's, it's crazy, but. So I think with this though, I, I, I was on a, a live stream for another thing yesterday and there's something I, I brought up that is, it just dawns on me is, is kind of interesting with this. So proof of work is, is something that's, that's, it might be a solution for this down the road. Um, it, so it's sort of like writing a book, you know, there's nothing saying that I know what I'm talking about. But I wrote a book. You know, I put in a lot of work and effort towards that. So I'm much more likely to get recognized for that. And so there, there's something to be said for that. You know, but but absolutely, we need more critical thinking. And I've got yeah. a kid oh. that's about to die by my hands here. He is tearing up my... <laughs> so, can, can, so, Steve, I just wanted to point this out. I still have this, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> that's great. I love this thing. I can beat myself, beat my kids. Yeah. Doesn't leave any more. No, uh, my my kids actually when I brought they they love this thing and they they'll take it out of my office and start whacking. <laughs> you know, it's, but, it's really it's a, it's a. I just want to say that's really a, a a really innovative thing. It just looks like a foam sword, 
but he, he yeah. created a piston system in there that that thing like really feels good and you can really work it you don't get hurt but you can really yeah it's great yeah yeah it's i mean and it's solid but as you saw it bends and it yep. moves but right. when you know it yeah it's i it, this is great this is the best outside the badge that you had that year the badges this is yeah, the that best thing good. that i took home yeah. <laughs> so but hey dj can we put that up where steve says jeff is right I mean, because I don't hear that, and I <laughs> screenshot it. I don't know, Sean. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> oh I'm share man! On Twitter, what my cats just did while we were talking here to my drapes. Ooh. Go get them. You, you can get off camera for a second. It's okay. Oh, they're gone <laughs> now. I kicked yeah. them. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, <laughs> awesome discussion today. Um, unfortunately, I need to get off to, to prepare for another <laughs> webinar myself. But um, practice makes perfect, right? So, yep. thanks for being with us here today. But I wanted to take a moment and do final thoughts. So, Steve, final thoughts from today. Well, I think just I, I want to thank you guys for this format. I think it's wonderful that we could talk about life issues and Im improving your quality of your life. So I would just encourage everybody to um, just go, try to do that. Try to do better. Try to look at how you can improve. Um, we talked about take kind of setting ambitious goals, going with what interests you, even if it seems unrelated. Go down paths. Look for new horizons. Um, you know, overcome some inertia. We're all feeling it, but the pandemic is tough. Is don't no yeah. judgment. You know, I said I'm a lazy overachiever. <laughs> you know, plenty of downtime, but you know mix the downtime with some real effort. And uh, I think you'll find that it's very invigorating and you'll find new interests and things that you may have talked yourself out of that if you just go for different pursuits, all come together eventually and just enrich your life. Absolutely. Well, Steve, thanks for being on. I'm going to kick you back to the green room. Thank here. you, sir. All right. Thanks all. Oops. You just disconnected him, um, didn't you? Ooh. Brilliant, DJ. No, I just cut him off. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, for me, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, I've got that inertia, and I need to get over it. DJ, you are well aware of it. Um, and I've been trying lately. I've been I've been doing. So I've really been push, trying to push myself through that. Um, but, you know, this was a great discussion. A lot of great topics covered across this. I, I can't even... Say thank you enough to Steve for joining us. Uh, last thing I do want to say, Red Wings, first game of the regular season tonight. Dylan Larkin named captain. Awesome. I have hope again for my Red Wings. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Which also means my Griffins. So, because they're the farm team. So, Nice. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to everybody that was able to show up today. Really appreciate it. The interaction has been great. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks, Jeff. What sport is it? Hockey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, obviously, Steve says thanks. Uh, Rachel says thanks. Uh, let's see. Brad says thanks. Martin says, thanks for the session today. And nice to hear from you and come with a bit of input myself as well. Get some mind going. Hey, Martin, maybe we need to have you on the show sometime too. Um, so awesome. Look, guys, I really appreciate being with us here today. It's It means a lot to us. Uh, this has been a, a great session. Actually, we had more chat interaction here than we ever have. And so I appreciate that uh, a great deal. So what I'll say about that is if you would like to uh, subscribe to our channel to get notifications of when we're going live next, we do this every week, folks. And so all you have to do is go to thrive-it.com slash sub me. It'll pop up with a little thing that says, do you want to subscribe to Thrive IT? And you'll say, heck yeah. And you hit that yes button and you get subscribed. Uh, but also to get notifications within YouTube, it's usually better to click that little bell icon that shows up right next to the subscribe button there. And so make sure you hit that subscribe button, click the bell button, and smash the like button. I don't know. I don't know why people say that, but it's like a YouTube thing. So I had to comply. It's like required now. If you don't, if you don't say smash the like button, you get kicked off of YouTube. 
that's what I hear it anyway. So anyway, thanks for being with us today. I did want to bring up one thing. Uh, if you would like a copy of my newest book, got to pitch it, got to do this thing where we're, we're trying to, you know, fund the channel and our efforts here. So great way to do that. Great way to support our efforts here is to buy my book. So thrive-it.com slash just do this. When you go to check out though, what I want you to do is enter coupon code thrivecast and I'm going to knock some, some dollars, some US dollars off of your purchase. Don't support uh, cryptocurrency yet, but that is another intention down the road. But uh, thrive-it.com slash just do this and then enter coupon code thrivecast when you check out. Greatly appreciate your time today. Greatly appreciate you being with us and greatly appreciate all of you who have hit the like button and subscribed. You are our heroes. Thanks for being with us today. We will see you next week for another Thrivecast. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Thrivecast. We truly hope you've enjoyed the experience and have learned a lot from it. Now, what we'd want from you next is to join us at thrive-it.com where you can get subscribed to our multiple channels, get subscribed to our newsletter, and do more to get yourself to where you want to be in your career and your life in information technology. If there's anything we can do to help you, please give us an email at support at thrive-it.com.